Good morning. It's great to see you all. Back in the days when I was Presbyterian, uh, we used to call ourselves the Frozen Chosen. Uh, <laughs> that might fit for Congregationalists too, today at least. So uh, it's nice to see you. And it's also nice to let you know that driving here from Marion, we went through three different seasons <laughs> in, in, about, in about 20 miles. So, uh, But we're here. And that does want uh, remind me to tell you I want to greet everyone and say hello at the end, and then we're getting out of Dodge to go home. Um, so, just just so you know, I mean, don't consider me more rude than you usually do. Okay, <laughs> uh, let me call your attention to the fridge notes. Uh, one of them is to let you know, we, we did these bulletins uh, last year, so things change a little bit. I just want to let you know that where it says on the trustees for the meeting schedule, um, the trustees will be meeting on the 15th at 7, and the council will be meeting on the 11th at 7. Got it right? Okay. So just FYI on that. Um, 
think that's about it. Do you have anything else that you've been on your hearts or minds? It's always a dangerous thing, but I I texted her. So yeah, d- our, our secretary uh, Deb was uh, at or in the hospital yesterday. She was pretty sick. She, you'll be uh, we'll be praying for her later, uh, but she's she's home and uh, was really glad she did these bulletins last year. <laughs> so let's uh, include her in our prayers in a special way. I think that's it. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. And as we begin our worship today, let us remember the love that Christ has for us, and may the love of Christ be with you. And also with you. Please join us on our first two songs, This is the Day and Brand New Day. All rise. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in Georgia. 
Yeah. <laughs> Second church family, it's time to celebrate new beginnings. Let's step, step into, into the new, new year, year with faith. People of faith, it's time to look ahead and hope. Let's step, step into, into the, the unknown, unknown with, with hope. hope. People of hope, it's time to walk in the footsteps of Jesus. Let's, Let's step, step forward, forward together, together as, as people, people of God. God. Don't leave. <laughs> Aren't we at children's message? Yeah. yeah. All right. You should have brought your whole gang with you. Is the posse up there? Where are they? There they are. Okay. Got it. She looked, she stopped, looked like she was going to get detention or something. I, I, I just didn't want to go up and down, up and down. You guys look so different. I haven't seen you since last year. You're much, uh, but I have something I want to share with you. I kind of uh, keep track of stuff like this. This is, uh, somebody did a, a poll asking kids to describe what love is. And this is from Chrissy, who is age six. Love is when you go out to eat and give somebody most of your French fries without making them give you anything of theirs. That's love. Uh, Noel, age seven, said, love is when you tell a guy you like his shirt and then he wears it every day. That's love. Um, Elaine, five, said, love is when mommy gives daddy the best piece of chicken. Marianne says, for love is when your puppy licks your face even after you left them alone all day. There you go. And this one, I'm not sure about, but this is Danny, age seven. Love is when my mommy makes coffee for my daddy and she takes a sip before giving it to him <laughs> to make sure it tastes okay. So that's, those are some of the definitions. So if I was going to ask you, what would you say what love is? <laughs> Anybody, you got any ideas, answers? Yeah, what do you think? Love is when you love someone no matter who they are? Yeah, yeah. Love is when you get their throat one kiss, even after he decides to wrestle you. <laughs> okay, so orange mints show love. There you go. Anybody else? Okay, I do want to tell you that one of the places we can look for love um, is in the Bible. And it has to do with God not only tells us what love is, but in Jesus, God shows us what love is. The Bible says this, God showed how much he loved us by sending Jesus to us, even though we didn't deserve it. Wow. That's really love. So what is love? What is it for us? Well, here's one more idea. When I share with others, when I see a chance to help, when I care for them, whether they do something for me or even if they never do something for me. That's pretty much love. Not quite as much as orange, mint, orange mints, but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty loving. All right, so remember that this week and in the days to come. Let's say a prayer before you go. Dear Father, we thank you for loving us when we don't deserve it. Help us, we ask, for the courage and the insight to love others that way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, now you can go back to your roost. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> um, in addition to the prayers that are going to be listed on, on the screen, and I'm all, there we go, um, we want to add that the Luke family are asking for prayers for Arthur Luke. And the Luke family and all of us are praying for um, Deborah, just Deborah, our secretary admin, to uh, get better quickly. Um, and then this is a strange one. It says all of us, but I'm not sure if it is all of us, <laughs> would like a little snow. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's all right if it comes around midnight. You know, everybody's home in bed. That's the end of the prayers for, that have been requested. 
So now what I want to know is, are we supposed to pray for snow or not? Yeah. We should probably pray for the people who want it. One time, this was a number of years ago, back when uh, they were protected, there was a man who got arrested for shooting a condor and ended up in the California courtroom in front of a judge because there were stiff consequences. could be prison, and it was a big fine. So the man begged the judge. He said, I just moved into this state, and I'd never seen a bird that large, and I was in the mountains, and I was starving. Couldn't help myself, so I shot him and ate him. The judge said, well, okay, but don't let it happen again. The man said, okay. And then as he was leaving, the judge said, sir, and he said, yes, he said, I'm curious, since nobody really knows, um, how does the condor taste? And he said, well, it tastes somewhere, it's somewhere between a whooping crane and a spotted owl. <laughs> Sometimes we just don't get it, and we continue to not get it. That's why we need to center ourselves all the time, together or individually, in prayer. Would you pray with me? Father, it's so easy to get distracted from what's most important. And what's most important is knowing and loving you, and knowing and loving those around us. Forgive us, we ask, for being task-driven instead of love-driven. Forgive us for loving things and using people when you teach us to live the other way around. So even though we're aware of all the ways we mess things up, we're here now and we're asking you to forgive us and make us one. Not one like people who dress alike, think alike, talk alike, raise our kids alike, spend our money alike. but a bunch of people who look at and celebrate the ways we're different. The ways we're able to say what we mean and mean what we say to one another in love. Today, God, we ask that in each of us you would crucify all pretension, hidden agendas, passive aggressiveness, veiled meanings, any scent of dishonesty. Give us the courage to be authentic, with one another, but in thoughtful and caring love. Forgive us for when we've thought more about how everyone else has failed us rather than how we've failed them. Forgive us for getting cranky when we're asked to serve instead of believing it's more blessed to give than to receive. Forgive us for holding grudges how could we ever do that when you've forgiven us so much? Forgive us for being easily offended. Make it our joy to overlook slights and offenses. We have things in common, God, and yet some of us live far apart. Some of us are introverts. Others of us are just weary of life's hostile, unkind experiences. Then there are times when we carry a spiritual chip on our shoulders, just looking for some way to be offended or hurt. Soothe that. Mend that. Help us to fulfill our call to live in a peace-filled and loving community. Build our unity and love for one another, Father, even as you love us. Because people who've been loved like that need to live differently. Not just loving one another, but loving each and every enemy. Please, Lord, continue to show us your love. Please, Lord, continue to help us to love you as we've been so perfectly and wonderfully loved by you. 
Now, God, we pray in the name of the one who taught us to pray this way by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now with joy in our hearts, let us give to the work of Christ church. And please join us in singing, gather us in. sing it again. (laughs) Let's pray. Great God, receive the gifts that we give in the manner in which we give. May they be used by the power of your spirit to serve and to love and to care. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Teacher, he asked, which is the most important commandment in the law? Jesus replied, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love him with all your mind. This is the first and most important commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his holy word. Amen. I remember this uh, afternoon really well. It was a, a long time ago because uh, we had a dog that thought one particular room in our house was his private bathroom. And our kids were little, so they were always spilling stuff everywhere. And I remember this day because Jeannie was downstairs in the room scrubbing on the carpet and saying her magic words and trying to get the stain out. And it seemed to me like it, this might be a thing from God because there was this knock at the door. I opened the door, and there's this young college-age kid standing there and said, I have this great carpet cleaner that I like to sell you. And I said, okay, well... Tell me about it real quick, what it does, how much it is. He goes, no, 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 I need to show you. He said, so if you just let me come in and put this stuff on your carpet, I can wipe it right up. And I thought, well, I know she's down there doing it. So I said, Jeannie, there's this guy at the door that wants to come in and clean our carpet. Um, and she said something in the effect of, tell him to get lost. Uh, the bottom line was no. So I went to the guy and said, uh, no. Yeah, she doesn't want you to do that. So this college kid looked at me and said, well, I guess I know who wears the pants in your family. <laughs> and I said, well, then I guess you know you're not talking to her. And I shut the door in his face. And he walked away thinking, how did that go wrong? I just wanted to get to the heart of the matter. And he wanted to stretch it out. In high school, I remember this really well, I decided that after reading the Bible for years, I was going to read it from cover to cover, Genesis to Revelation. Uh, don't, don't ever do that. You get stuck in Leviticus, and all of a sudden, you're, there's stuff you don't care about, you don't know about, and there are a whole bunch of laws that mean... At least if you're a Jew, probably if you're a Christian too, you can't really play football because that's a pigskin. You can't eat hot dogs because who knows what's in there. And you can't do a whole bunch of other stuff. So I stopped after Leviticus. So my suggestion is when people want to know God, handing them a Bible may not be enough. And when people say, I'm going to read the Bible, don't let them start in the beginning and try to read through it's good to read it all eventually, but you get stuck. What they really want to know, what they really need to know, is the purpose of the Bible. Its center, its pith, its quintessence. Do you ever use that word? I, I remember I went to seminary and uh, we were given a Bible passage and the teacher said, I want you to write three paragraphs on the quintessence of this passage. We, we don't talk like that in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. I had no idea what a quintessence was. So I had to go to the dictionary and encyclopedia first. And basically the way I remember it, it's when something is refined down to its most powerful, most basic essence. Quintessence. That's what we got today. It's called the Great Commandment. And it gives us the heart of the matter. It only makes sense. If I'm sick, I don't want the doctor to give me page after page of medical ease. It might be factual. It might be true. But it doesn't help me any. I just want him to get to the heart of the matter. And so Jesus does it when he's being tested in 63 words. Three sentences. That's it. That's what people want to know. The heart of the matter. That's what the great commandment is. It's a setup, you know. This is Tuesday of Holy Week. And you know uh, the triumphal entry just happened two days before. And Good Friday is coming. And all of that. And right now, the leaders in the temple are trying to trick Jesus. 
they give him this trick question. The scribes are fighting with one another. Jesus comes up and one of them says to him, which commandment is the most important? It's a setup, you know, because you're going to be in trouble almost no matter what you say. And they think, like they do in so many situations, we got them. Because there are ten commandments, and by the time we get to the middle of the Old Testament, the rabbis have added 603 more. And in Jesus' time, they had finally settled on about 760 rules, laws, commandments. That's a lot. So they're testing to see if Jesus knows them all, if he can pick one, and if he doesn't pick the correct one, because the way it works, the Sadducees and Pharisees, when they always mention them together, means they're up to no good because they hate each other. The only thing they can agree on is trying to get Jesus. So whatever one he picks, the Sadducees are going to say, that's not it, and the Pharisees will say, yes it is, or vice versa. Jesus says, number one, love the Lord your God. Number two, love your neighbor as yourself. So, if on your week or your daily schedule, you can only check a couple of objectives off, I'd say it's those two. Because Jesus showed them because Jesus told them from the Old Testament, and because Jesus lived them. They're watching, listening, and evaluating Jesus, and he says, you know the Shema? That's in Deuteronomy. At that point in time, the Jews were saying it every day. In the Old Testament, uh, in, in that time, they were saying it twice a day. In the Old Testament, they said it at least once a day. You've probably heard it. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And the other one is from Leviticus. Who knew? I mean, Barry did all of these goofball rules. Who knew? Well, Jesus knew, not me. Because he knew his Bible better than the people that were trying to trick him on it. It's 19 chapters in, in case you want to start looking for it. It says, don't be vengeful or bear a grudge, but love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. Now, why they have all the other chapters and rules about pigs and other stuff, I don't know. But it's in there. Don't be vengeful or bear a grudge. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's really how Jesus summed up the law and the prophets. Love God, love your neighbor. How simple. Not always easy, but how simple. You have to love God because there's only one God and only one true God. God's special. God's the unique creator and ruler. Those were some of my most fun discussions when I taught philosophy of religion was we used to talk about things. uh, My students would talk about creation of the universe, and I'd say, okay, well, so what do you think? And they'd say, well, I know, it it was the Big Bang. And I'd say, well, who banged it? What? Well, it didn't, I mean, did it just happen? And then there's this Native American theory. I don't know, I'll maybe sometime tell you the story of Grandma Turtle. But that's sort of how the land came to be, and the natives uh, have this wonderful story. So one of my students knew that, and he said, well, what about all of creation? God built everything on the back of a turtle. And I said, I know that one. And he said, so what do you think? And I said, well, what's under the turtle? He said, another turtle. I said, okay, so what's under that one? Another turtle. And and finally he said, don't ask me. It's pretty much turtles all the way down. That's what he said. (laughs) Well, that's one way to look at it. Who banged the Big Bang? God. Who made the turtles? God. That's why we need to love him, because of who he is. 
that's our supreme duty to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, strength. And how did they not know that? Or did they? Jesus takes them on about being such hypocrites and such nitpickers. The religious leaders at the time, this, this is how they did it. When they talked about a tithe, that was 10% of everything. They went to their spice cabinets and measured out a tenth of each spice, a tenth of their clothing, a tenth of their salary, a tenth of everything. And they were so busy keeping track of it that they missed the God's love part, the heart of Judaism. Because to love God means you want to do the will of God. And what the will of God is, is for us to love him. That's the highest pursuit. It's the first and greatest commandment. Love God. And it covers a whole lot of sins. You know? When you do something lovingly and it's a huge fail, you put love into it. And then Jesus says, and uh, love your neighbor. Because according to Jesus, according to the Bible, according to every word God speaks, you can't love God and hate your neighbor. There's this really cool, it's a bluegrass song uh, called You Don't Love God If You Don't Love Your Neighbor. And I was going to sing it for you, but I I love you too much to do that. But if you can just imagine in that kind of twang, There are many people who will say they're Christian and they live like Christians on the Sabbath day. But come Monday morning till the coming Sunday, they will fight their neighbor all along the way. If if you don't love your neighbor, sorry. If you don't love your neighbor, if you gossip about him, if you never have mercy, if he gets into trouble and you don't try to help him, then you don't love your neighbor. And you don't love of God. That's the song. How did they know? Because Jesus told them, because Jesus lived it. Because of these words, Paul figured it out. So now, faith, hope, and love abide these three. But the greatest of these, guess which one? Love. There is a guy uh, whose music I have admired for a long time. Uh, he, he's, a, he's a mixed bag of a guy. His name is, uh, was Kenny Rankin. He was a singer and songwriter. He, uh, he got his start as the opening act for George Carlin. And they used to fly on, their, on Carlin's private plane, and that's also where he learned to do cocaine. And I don't know where he learned to chain smoke, but he did two packs a day at the height of his addiction. So when Carlin died in 2008, Kenny Rankin sang at his funeral. A year later, three weeks after he was diagnosed with lung cancer, uh, he died. But he had something. He had this mixed priorities always going on. In fact, I've looked this up because I didn't believe this at first. He has this wonderful version of the Beatles song, Blackbird. And it was so good that when Lennon and McCartney were inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame, Paul McCartney asked him to sing it at the induction. So he wrote this song, What Matters Most. And at different times, things had competed in his life for that. His life was always in a constant flux. But this is what the song says. It's not how long we held each other's hand. It's not how far we traveled on our way. The early morning smiles we tearfully recall. What matters most is that we loved at all. What are the top three things in life that you cherish the most? Chances are, they're not things. 
I've spent a lot of time sitting beside hospital beds of people who are dying. And you know what? No one has ever said, can you get a copy of the Wall Street Journal? I want to see how my funds are doing. Nobody has said, let me tell you about my boat, how big it is, how much it costs. Let me show you pictures of my home. They say, will you make sure my family knows I love them? Can you reach over there and get my wallet? I want to show you some pictures. That's my grandbaby. That's my dog. That's my family. The things they cherish most, they realize, are not even things. The early morning smiles we tearfully recall. Kenny Rankin wrote, What matters most is that we love it all. Because the most important things aren't things. So, love matters. Memories matter. Time matters. What matters most is that we love the one who made us, who thought somehow we mattered. What matters most is how we share that love with everybody else. It's not how many summer times we had to give to fall, the early morning smiles we tearfully recall. What matters most, Rankin says, is that we loved it all. Amen. The best definition I have ever read, the best, um, about communion and how it should work, especially this is my motto as a minister, it's one beggar showing all the other beggars where to find bread. It's here. The bread of life. The cup of the new covenant. One time I was trying to, uh, this was back when I was young and wow, I was so brilliant. <laughs> you would have loved me then. I knew everything. <laughs> I was trying to get the congregation. It was a fairly staid, older Presbyterian congregation. And I wanted them to say, the body of Christ broken for you and the cup of the new covenant. One lady got a little puzzled. I think I was at a nursing home when it, it happened and they were going around trying to say the things that this one lady who was a little hard of hearing said, this is the, the she said, take it, it's for sinners. And I went, you know, that's, that's pretty right. That's pretty true. It's for those of us who don't deserve to be here. We're the ones that are called out of God's grace and out of God's love. And because of the fact that while we don't live by bread alone, Jesus knew we didn't live long without it either. So he made it that when we eat, when this bread is broken, we remember his body broken. We remember the wheat that is crushed, the flour that is made, the love that is baked. And the same way with the cup. After their meal, he took the one common cup that they shared and poured it in their presence. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. So as we begin this new year, let us remember the bread that is broken for us the cup that is poured for us. Let us share in it together. <coughs>
body of Christ broken for you. The body of Christ broken for you. <coughs> this is the body of Christ broken for you. Did you already get your... And then Jesus took the common cup and poured it and they shared in it as was their custom. And he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. Think of it, all of you. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks unto the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. This is the cup of the new covenant. Let us share in it together. Now let's share in the prayer that's printed in your bulletin. Let us pray. Loving God, we give you thanks for restoring us in your image and nourishing us with spiritual food. Now, now send, send us forth as a people healed and renewed, and renewed that we may show your love to the world by showing your children as Jesus' hands and feet. Amen. And please join us on our last song, God is Good. All rise if you are willing or able, and kids, if you want instruments, they're back here. God is good all the time. He put a song of praise in this heart of mine. God is good all the time. Through the darkest night, His light will shine. God is good. God is good all the time. Promised to 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's enough. Go. In the name of God, go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Have a 